team. And good morning, New Life Community Church. How's everyone doing today? Hope everyone had a good 4th of July. I'm excited today to continue this series that we recently began on the names of God. There are so many of them in the Bible, more than we can count. And you might not see them if you're reading the Bible in English, which I'd say most people do, because these names are from the Hebrew and Greek language, many of them, which is how they can escape our notice. But we're going to look at one today that's in Hebrew, and it's one of my favorite names of God, which is why I'm speaking on it. We're going to go straight to the passage where we find it, and that is Exodus chapter 20. Any of you will recognize this as the passage that contains the Ten Commandments. So if you want to know where is this name of God found, it is actually found in the Second Commandment, which we're going to start with. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. God says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I don't want you to be intimidated by those verses about the sins of generations being punished. Notice God says, I will punish generations that basically repeat the sins of their parents. That's really what God is saying here. God is not going to make anyone pay for what their parents did. But if you walk in the ways of parents who disobeyed God, you will deal with the same consequences that they did. However, God says, oppositely, I will show love to a thousand generations of those who love me. So if someone disobeys me like their parents did and their parents and, you know, their children do what their parents did over and over and over again, that same consequence of disobedience will keep on happening. But as soon as someone turns from the wicked ways of the past and loves God, that person will experience blessing a thousand times over for as many children and, and generations that they have that will love God. Whatever happened in the past will be canceled. So God is saying here, it's really up to me. Who are you going to worship? It's up, to, it's up to you. Are you going to worship me or are you going to worship someone else? And that's really what this name of God comes down to, God being jealous. It's something that might not make us feel warm and fuzzy on the inside at first, but it's all about who we're going to worship. You know, God wants us to worship him, which is why he is jealous. But some of you have maybe never heard that before. You know, like, wait, God is jealous? So, you know, let's, let's focus on that first part. I am a jealous God. That who wants you to worship me, God says, and, and no one else. So first, when you hear that, like I said, this name of God might be a little bit different from all the others because this one does not give you the warm and fuzzies. You know, the other names of God, Emmanuel, God with us. You know, Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. The God who sees me. You know, God our Savior. And then you hear, jealous God. Oh, that might not sit well with you at first. You know, when you hear the word jealous, and if you've ever used it in a sentence, you know, how would, what's a sentence that you would normally use the word jealous in? Normally, you'd say something like jealous boyfriend or a jealous husband, right? Jealous girlfriend. You guys ever seen a jealous pet before? We have some of those. You guys know if you have like more than one dog or more than one cat in the house, sometimes you start petting one animal and you start showing them affection, and then the other one gets jealous and just runs from the other side of the room and pushes the other one out of the way to get affection, right? It's like they didn't care about being pet until they saw the other dog or cat getting pet. So that's the kind of jealousy that we normally see when we picture jealous. You know, one person getting affection or getting attention and someone else coming out of nowhere and spitefully pushing someone out of the way so they can get that attention. Is God like that? That's the question we need to answer. Because a lot of people have wrestled with this idea of God being jealous. And a lot of people who have heard this didn't like it. Oprah Winfrey once said that she first heard about God's jealousy when she was sitting in church in her 20s. 
She said, quote, this great minister was preaching on how great God was and how omniscient and omnipresent God is and everything. And then he said, the Lord thy God is a jealous God. He read this verse. Oprah said, I was caught up in the rapture of that moment until he said jealous. And something struck me. I was like 27 or 28, and I'm thinking, God is all. God is omnipresent, and God is also jealous? God is jealous of me? And something about that didn't feel right in my spirit. After that, Oprah said she didn't want to worship a God like that anymore, and she began searching for other doctrines on God outside of Christianity. As for what Oprah believes now, it seems she is a universalist which is a person who believes all religions lead to God, whoever or whatever he or she is. So that's an example of a person who didn't like the idea of God being jealous, but Oprah got it wrong. At first, when she heard it, she thought God was jealous of her. That doesn't make sense. Do we have anything that God wants? Are we better looking, smarter, stronger, or really better at anything than God? No. God is not jealous of us. He is jealous for us. There's a big difference. God is not jealous of us. He is jealous for us. And that is the title of our message today. The God who is jealous for us. This name of God is Elkanah. And again, you do not see it in that passage. You know, you can look real close. You, You won't see it because it's in Hebrew. So the Hebrew name for God is El Kana. Kana is the Hebrew word for jealous. So how could this possibly be a good thing? Oprah didn't understand like how God's jealousy was different from ours. But that is the first thing you need to know. God's jealousy is different from our jealousy. The way we get jealous is not the way that God gets jealous. But I would say even sometimes our jealousy is justified. It is. Most of the time, it's selfish, but sometimes it's justified. Uh, Let me give you an example that I think anyone would agree with. Imagine you have been an amazing parent to your children. You have been the best parent that any parent could be. You don't just put a roof over their head and, and clothe them and feed them. You give them advice. You listen to them. Whenever they come home from school with a problem, they're upset, you stop what you're doing and you listen to them and you talk with them. You discipline them because you care. You provide for them because you love them, not because you have to, because you want to. And you do all this stuff, right? And then one day, your kid comes home from school and says, hey, you know, uh, I was talking with, uh, with my friend Johnny about his mommy, and I wish that Johnny's mommy was my mommy, or, you know, Jimmy's mommy or whatever, you know? The kid comes home and says, I wish Jimmy's mommy was my mommy. But you know something about Jimmy's mommy. You know that Jimmy's mommy is a drug addict, and does not care about Jimmy. You know, it's not even like she's trying to quit. She's like, I don't care about you. Jimmy is a latchkey kid, and he has to take care of himself. You know, mom never has any time for him, and is a bad and negligent parent that has been reported to Child Protective Services multiple times. And your kid comes home and says, I want Jimmy's mommy to be my mommy instead of you. What's the word you would use to describe your feelings? I imagine jealous would be one of them. You'd probably say, how dare you? You know, what is wrong with you? Would you feel maybe a little jealous? Does anyone here think that that kind of jealousy would be wrong? If you were an incredible parent and, and you knew that your child wanted a negligent parent to raise them instead of you, that is God's jealousy. God's jealousy is not because he is insecure. It is not petty. It's not because he doesn't know that he, or he's not sure that he is a good parent. It's because he knows that he is. And I think any one of us would feel jealous if we treated our spouse the same way. You know, if you were faithful to your wife or to your husband or your boyfriend or girlfriend if you're not married yet, and you had done everything for them, but they went off with someone else who treated them like garbage— you would feel a righteous sense of jealousy, and you should, because jealousy and coveting are different things. Coveting, which is against the Ten Commandments. You know, we just read one of the Ten Commandments that said, you know, do not, uh, do not worship other idols. There's another commandment 
that says, do not covet. So clearly that is wrong. That is a sin. Coveting is wanting something that belongs to someone else. Jealousy is desiring something that belongs to you or something that is rightfully yours to have. That is the difference between coveting and being jealous. God does not sin. So his jealousy is not sinful. Our jealousy often is. Because look at what our jealousy leads us to do. When we get jealous, this often leads us to acts of revenge, selfishness, pettiness, cruelty, speaking uh, harmful words to someone. That's what our jealousy leads to. Our jealousy leads us to do the wrong thing. God's jealousy leads him to do the right thing, as we are going to see. So we've already laid the precept that God's jealousy is different from ours. There are three points today that I want to make about God's jealousy. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write them down. Number one, God's jealousy is not because he is insecure or needy. That's the first thing to know. God does not need anything from us. And this is going to carry over into the next points. When we're, jealousy, it's normally, when we're jealous, it's normally because we need someone to fill a deficiency in our life. Please understand this. God does not need anything from us that he cannot obtain himself. He doesn't need anything from us. He wants things from us. He wants praise. He wants relationship from us, but he doesn't need it. If he doesn't get it, he's not going to feel lonely. He's not going to feel left out. God does not have FOMO which is short for fear of missing out. He can be perfectly happy without us. He doesn't need anything from us, but he wants us. And that's where the way we are towards people is very different. You know, we tend to be very needy, very clingy, and when we get needy and clingy, we, we drain other people. We can be very, very draining. And God is not like that. This word, Elkanah, Jealous God means a lot to me. It might offend some people, and it might make some people uncomfortable. I think only before you understand what it means. But for, the, but for me, this name is one of my favorite names of God because it pulled me out of a really bad place in my life. Some of you have heard this story. When I was in my early 20s, I was a needy, clingy friend. I wasn't really a good friend to the, the people that I knew in high school and college at all. I was very clingy. I was very selfish. And whenever I talked with my friends and with other people, it was about me and it was for me. It wasn't for them. And the problem was whenever something would happen in my life, either exciting and happy or bad and upsetting, I wouldn't go to God first. I'd pray to God, you know, sometimes if I thought of it. But normally that would be an afterthought. I'd go to other people first. If something happened where I had like an argument with my family members and I had like a falling out, I'd go to my friends and tell them about it first. Bad idea. And if ever I had a falling out or a disagreement with my friends where one of them upset me, I would go to my family and tell them about it, accidentally pitting people against each other. And whenever something really exciting happened, like I had a really good day at work or something cool happened, I would call up my friends and I would say, hey, I got to tell you what happened. Wouldn't even ask, how are you doing? Or how was your day? Or has anything exciting happened to you lately? You know, we all need to just, you know, just vent sometimes. You know, there's something that we just have on the tip of our tongue that we can't hold back. But seriously, every time you talk to people, you, hopefully you guys don't know anyone like that the way I was back then. Where whenever I talked to my friends, I talked more than I listened. I, I did it for me more than I did it for them. And the problem was I went to them first and I would maybe talk to God about a problem only after I talked to friends and family and basically everyone else in my life. I probably talked to my dog and like went to her for advice before like I, I talked to God. And because I did this, I caused a lot of damage. Some of my friends finally were honest with me and said, listen, we think you're being really selfish. We think you're being a bad friend. And I was so offended by that because when you're prideful, when you think you're doing everything right, I was so proud that I have all these friends that I can go to. And that made me feel good because they were validating me. They were validating that I was a good friend and a good person. And now the tables were turned and now I didn't feel like a good friend and a good person because I wasn't at the time. I was being selfish. And one of my really close friends, his name is Kyle. He lives in Florida now. I've known him since the ninth grade. 
he called me up on the phone and said, listen, man, you know, I know everyone's really letting you have it right now. He said, but I want you to know I'm still your friend. I still love you. And he said, but God gave me a word for you when I was actually in the shower. You never know when God's going to speak to you. He said, I was in the shower, and he said, I heard God's voice clearly speak to me and give me a word for you. And I'm like, well, what did he say? And he said, God put this name for himself on my heart, and he wanted you to hear it. God said, call Mike and, you know, tell him, I want him to know that my name is Elkanah. And I, he's like, have you ever heard that name for God before? And until that point, I'd never heard it. Because, you know, I'd, I'd read parts of the Bible. I hadn't read the whole thing yet. But, you know, I had read, I had read uh, the, that commandment in English. So he's like, do you know where that is? I'm like, it, I've heard of it, but I, I don't know what it means. And he said, it's in the second commandment. It's where God says, I am a jealous God. And, and that's the Hebrew word for, for jealous, kana. So God, he wants you to know that his name is jealous. That's one of his names. And he said he wants you to know this because he is jealous for your attention. And he wants you to go to him first. And he said you've been going, Kyle said you've been going to me and to all of your other friends and family members before going to God. And he wants you to know that he's jealous for your attention. He wants you to talk to him first. And I broke down. That word was for me because that was the thing that I had not been doing. What's the order that the two greatest commandments are in? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. First love God, then love people. Go to God first, then go to people. I was doing it backwards. And when I heard that, that God actually wanted me to go to him first, that he was jealous for my attention, that he wanted me selflessly more than anyone else, that freed me and that put all of my relationships in order. Unfortunately, I apologize for my selfishness. I now listen more than I talk, except for when I'm up here. And I'm still friends with all those people and I was able to repair those friendships because I learned that God's jealousy is a good thing and that freed me to go to him first. So that's why this name of God means so much to me. I realized I was needy and he is not. I am selfish and he is not. He made me. He made us. He made everything. So he only wants attention and praise and recognition from what he created from what belongs to him anyway. So that's the first point. God's jealousy is not a matter of insecurity. God is not insecure. Number two, God's jealousy only wants what already belongs to him. I mentioned that before. Our jealousy wants what belongs to others. Like I said, that is coveting. If you want what belongs to someone else, that's wrong because you didn't create that. You don't own that. You don't deserve that. That person or that thing that you want does not belong to you. Whether it's a, a person who is in a relationship with someone else, whether it is a promotion or a position someone else has, if it is someone else's house, someone else's car, someone else's salary, or anything else, that does not belong to you. So that jealousy is bad. The good jealousy we talked about is if you are jealous for the attention and the affection of a spouse or a child, that is a relationship that belongs to you. And that is something that you deserve, not something that belongs to someone else. And then number three, God's jealousy desires giving, not receiving. That's extremely important. Our jealousy is often selfish. It is based on getting. In the example that I gave, I wanted attention from my friends. I wanted validation from them. I wanted to receive. But what person have you ever known that is jealous because they missed out on an opportunity to give something? Have you ever heard a jealous person say, oh, man, I wish I could take that girl to exp expensive restaurants. You know, I wish I could, like, give them a bunch of things, you know, even if they didn't love me back in return. Have you ever known any jealous person whose jealousy creates frustration in them because they want to give more than they want to receive? That is God. God wants to give and he wants to help people more than he wants to receive because he doesn't need anything from us. I would say it's hard to love someone if the thing you focus on in that relationship is what you get out of it, if you need stuff from people. Think about it. As a parent, if you need validation from your children, you will fail in many areas as a parent. 
I've yet to experience this. I don't have children of my own yet. Well, one who's going to be here soon. But I haven't experienced raising children yet. But when I do that, I'm constantly going to be checking with God to make sure that I'm checking with him to make sure I'm a good parent, not checking with them. Because kids can say some pretty hurtful things. I know I did when I was a little boy, you know, and even a teenager. Have you ever said to your parents or ever heard your children say, you're the worst parent ever? Anyone ever said that, you know? When your parents, like, didn't let you go somewhere, didn't let you go out to that party or hang out with those friends or get that thing. You're the worst dad or you're the worst mom ever. At that point, if you're not checking with God to make sure that you're doing a good job and you're letting your kids be the barometer, you're going to feel like a failure and you're going to make mistakes trying to cater to them. But if you can put your foot down and say, I love you, I know you don't mean that, I'm doing the right thing and I'm not changing my decision. So when you need validation, you really can't do a good job because you're relying on someone else to complete you. And that's a big burden to put on another person. You're putting a burden on someone else to complete you. So can you really love someone selflessly if you need things from them? And there are certain relationships where it is based on neediness. Children can't take care of themselves. They do need you. But you can't really be sure that you love someone until you are able to give to them even when you cannot get anything in return. That is love that has been tested. You may still love someone that you need things from, but that love is tested and proven and, vet and verified if you can love someone who cannot give you anything in return, someone that you do not need to complete you or assist you in any way. It is all for them. It is none of you. That is true love. That is the love that God has for us. He only wants what's best for us. He wants to give us his best. Have you ever heard someone say, or maybe if you wanted to be in a relationship with someone, you loved them? I know back when I was trying to get my wife's attention, back before we were dating, I had really strong feelings for her, and she didn't feel the same way yet. I knew that this might not end well for me, that she might end up with someone else because it's not my right to be in a relationship with her. It's her decision. She doesn't belong to me. And as hard as it was for me to say, I'm like, God, I know I need to come to the place where I want what's best for her even if it's not me. I don't know if I ever came to that place. <laughs> but I, I knew that was right, that I want what's best for her, even if it's not me. Here's the difference with God. He knows that there is no best for us apart from him. There is no one better than him. I had to acknowledge that I would not necessarily be the best boyfriend, fiance, and husband in the world. That there could be someone out there who would do better than me. And there are people who, who are doing better that they're, they're better at being a spouse, better at, at taking care of someone. And sometimes it's just a matter of compatibility. You know, maybe I could be doing everything right, but there's someone else who would be a better fit in a relationship. So sometimes you have to acknowledge that maybe someone else can do a better job of making a person happy than you can. God knows there is no one else. There is no one apart from him or beside him or beyond him that can do a better job in a relationship than he can. One example of this that I want to give, you can turn to this if you want. I won't have the verses up on the screen. It's 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's a story of where God wants to be the leader of his people. He wants to be the one that they go to, but they don't want it in return. This is where Israel is asking for a king. They want someone to rule over them, and they don't want God to be the one who does it. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 8. It starts in verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Samuel is a prophet. His sons don't want to be a prophet or a leader like him. So the people of Israel are saying, We want a king over us. And the reason they want a king is not a good one. It's because all the other nations around them have a king. So that's why they want one. Verse 6, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. Samuel went to God first. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people. Uh, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. 
so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim, let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So you can hear the grieving in God's voice. You know, God, he can take it. He's a man. You know, if we yell at him and say, you're the worst parent ever, he can take it. He's not going to go off in a corner and cry. But it is possible to grieve the Holy Spirit and to grieve the heart of God. God said he was grieved when he looked at all the sin that had covered the earth and infected mankind before the global flood. So God is not going to go like throw a pity party and you're not going to make God emotionally unstable, but he is grieved. He can be saddened. And you can hear sort of the sadness in God's voice where he's like, I wanted to rule over them, but they have been rejecting me for all of this time. So if they're going to reject me, give them what they want. Give them a king. And if you guys know any of your Bible history, the first king over Israel, Saul, was a selfish and jealous man. Jealous in the bad way with a lowercase j. He was so jealous that when God said that David would take the throne instead of him, he tried to kill David. That is bad jealousy. And when all that happened, you know, Israel did have some good kings, but none of them were ever as good a king as God was to them. None of those kings looked out for their best interests as much as God did. That's why I cite this as an example of the fact that no one can love us or lead us better than him. He's not jealous and insecure because he thinks someone else can do it better. He's jealous because he knows that no one else can. God's jealousy is not based on doubt. It is based on knowing. And that is part of what makes it different. And I would pose this question. If you're still not comfortable with God's jealousy, consider this question. Would it be better if he wasn't jealous? Would that make you happy? Would it make you happy if we could walk away from God and say, thanks, I don't need you, I'm done. And he's like, okay, no skin off my nose. You know, have a nice life. You know, go rot in hell and see if I care. God never says that. He says he doesn't want to lose anyone. He doesn't want anyone to walk away. You've heard the parables of Jesus where the one shep- where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. God doesn't go, ah, I still got 99. I'm good. You can go wreck yourself for all I care. God still wants us even when we don't want him. Would you prefer if he didn't care? Would you prefer if he was not jealous? Because what are some antonyms, what are some opposites of the word jealous? I would say probably words like callous, apathetic, Imagine if you walked away from your spouse and they said, eh, I don't care. Imagine if you walked away from your parents or your kids walked away from you and you both said, eh, I don't care. I don't care if I never see you again. I don't care if you want to be with someone else. Doesn't matter to me. I'm not jealous. Doesn't hurt me one bit. Would you prefer if God was that way? I wouldn't. And you know, many people think that's how he is, but he's not. God wants you Every single one of you sitting here today, every person on this planet, he wants you. And even though he will still be okay, he will not be lonely if he doesn't have you, he wants you anyway just because he loves you and what he sees in you and what he put in you. That is why he is jealous. It is not a matter of selfishness. Would a jealous person ever give to you, even though you could get nothing in return? Would a jealous person pursue you, but also be willing to give you your space? Have you ever known a jealous person who is willing to give you your space? Joanne said it before during worship, God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on you. And that's absolutely correct. Have you ever known of a jealous gentleman before? It sounds like an oxymoron, right? A jealous gentleman? Well, congratulations, you know one now. His name is God, El a jealous God. He is jealous, also a gentleman. And finally, have you ever known a jealous person who would give up their life for you even if they knew you would never love them in return? Not some suicide or, or sacrificial gesture out of spite or add to be dramatic, but to die on a cross like this because he loved everyone on this planet, even though he knew a lot of us would never love him back. Have you ever known a jealous person to do that? Like I said, our jealousy drives us to sin. Do you know what God's jealousy drove him towards? That, the cross. How could that be bad jealousy? 
This is not bad jealousy. This is the best jealousy you have ever known in your life and will ever know. So I am glad that God is jealous because I know he is still good. He is the best of the good. He loves us more than anyone ever could. And I am glad that he is jealous for me and for every single person here. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for all that you are. That there is so much to you that no one name could contain everything that you are. But you want everyone here today to know that you are jealous in a good way, in the only right way. And you are speaking to everyone here right now. You want them to know how much you want them. You're telling them right now, everyone here, why are you running? Why are you hiding? Why are you distracting yourself? Why are you ignoring me? Why are you going to other people instead of me? I love you. I want you. Even though I don't need you, I love you and I have things for you. I want to listen to you. I want to lead you. I want to fill that void in your life. I want to complete you. Only I can. I am enough for you. And I have always loved you. That is what God is saying to everyone here today. I hope that we'll hear it and receive it. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, even when I didn't always go to you first. Thank you that there's nothing I I could ever do to make you turn against me or just leave me behind. Thank you that your jealousy keeps me and holds me in your hand no matter what. We praise you, Lord, and love you and invite you in to be in relationship, close relationship with us today. We pray this in your name. Amen.